All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. We're really excited uh, for today's event. We have some incredible guests who are going to be joining us and uh, speaking with us today. So we couldn't be more excited to be hosting another event uh, in partnership with the Gore Downey and Chani Wan Jack Fund. So the Downey Wan Jack Fund is part of uh, musician Gore Downey's legacy and embodies his commitment and that of both the Downey and Wenjack families to call Canadians to action in solidarity with Indigenous peoples of this land. So the goal is to continue the conversation that began uh, with Chani Wenjack's residential school story and to support uh, the reconciliation uh, process through awareness, education, and action. So like I said, we are thrilled to have very special guests today. We have uh, Chani Wenjack's sisters, Pearl Ashney Pinescom and Daisy Monroe, uh, joining us today as we remember what would have been their brother's 66th birthday last Sunday. So they're joining us from Dennis Franklin uh, Cromarty High School in Thunder Bay. And over the years, the Wenjack family has grown to over 200 people living across Canada, including Ogoki Post, Thunder Bay, and as far north as Pond Inlet, uh, Nunavut. So Pearl and Daisy have been incredible advocates for sharing uh, their brother's story especially with Canada's youth. So uh, Pearl and Daisy, it is such an honor to have you joining us live today and to be hosting you. We're really looking forward to getting to know you a little bit better today. We've got a great group of classrooms from across North America tuning in with us. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing uh, your brother's story uh, from your perspective. So it's great to have you joining us from Thunder Bay today. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pearl, and um, I live at uh, Martin Falls. Um, and uh, and I've lived there since uh, since I was born. But I had uh, gone to school uh, eight years of my life, including two years after for high school. Um, the reason why the um, story was told. I, uh, I was on that was at home when uh, they brought um, Charlie home from uh, the coffin. And um, that turned my life around and uh, almost hit the uh, rock bottom. But uh, I thought that um, that this wasn't going to end at that time. I had always wanted to tell the story. And and so that's what I began to do. Uh, whoever listened, uh, I would tell them what uh, what had happened and the impact, uh, the impacts that I saw from that. It wasn't just only me, it was my whole family. And it was especially my parents. My parents that uh, hit rock bottom with his death. They never understood, as the government um, promised us, that they would take care of them. And when that happened, when I saw my parents, um, not almost recover from that. That's when I I went really first to try and tell his story. And it came about that was back in 1966. And I kept on going. And every meeting that I went, I would I would tell anybody the story. If I met people on the plane, I would tell, especially the white people, the story. And I kept on doing this for all those years until one day um, Mike called me and said that, uh, that they had uh, made songs about Charlie, 10 songs to be exact. And he had asked if he would come and visit, visit us in Martin Falls. And I said that they, they could. And because they said, uh, we don't know what else, what else to do. So, um, 
So when they did come, you know, that's when all the other ideas of how to um, put it on the national platform came about. I had always wanted to tell everybody the story, but I just didn't know how I would do it on a, on a national basis. And when he had called, uh, I knew then that it would be told at a national base. And I'm glad I wanted to make everybody aware of what happened with these little kids. These little kids that were promised a golden future, safety, and love. Those actually were the ones that were absent in our life. The promises that was made to the, to the children. They're absent, they were absent in life because no one at that school really thought of them as human beings. And I had uh, also wanted to have the children heard rather than uh, being told to be quiet. I wanted children's voices to be laughing. I wanted children to be seen. And if that, if that is what it takes to expose these children to be thought of, as human beings, and so be it. I know when I walk this road again, over and over again, I know it hurts. But I, but I want to do that. There's many tears that fall when I walk this road again. But to save the lives of the native children, but only want to live, but only want to enjoy life, I'll do it. And I want to say how glad I am that all the children are interested in hearing this. I also have with me my son William, who is beside me here. He is my youngest son, and my granddaughter, Sunset. And I've always been glad to see the happiness. When I walk around in this school here today, I see the, the stuff that they do the pictures that they draw, you know, it says something about them. That they, they finally, that they are going to enjoy life. And I hope other people give them that space to enjoy life to its fullest. That's all I wish for. Miigwech. All right. And that's, uh, you know, I think that's a wish that everybody can relate to is having that wish that everybody should have a chance to enjoy life, um, be young uh, and and be with their family. And I think that's why this story resonates so much is, is your brother, you know, that desire to be home. He wanted to be home. Um, and I think that story resonates with, with children across Canada. So it's so brave of you to share that story, to be sharing it for years and years, because um, I know it's not easy. Uh, to do so, but it is having a huge impact uh, in classrooms across Canada uh, with people across Canada. And today is a good example. We have uh, legacy schools, legacy schools joining from across uh, Canada today who are doing activities in their classrooms, sharing stories, and doing something to work towards reconciliation. So again, it's really awesome to have um, your family here today, different generations of your family, and to share uh, Chani's story. 
So I do want to ask, because you mentioned uh, Mike uh, a little bit earlier in your story. So Mike Downey, uh, Gord's brother, we hosted Mike last October and he shared uh, during Secret Path Week a little bit about how he came uh, upon your brother's story. He was driving in his car, he heard the story, uh, he pulled over right away uh, to take it in and it really, it, it impacted him in that car and he knew he wanted to do something. So he talked to his brother Gord uh, and then they reached out to you. What, wh how did you feel after telling your story for so long uh, when someone like Mike reached up and reached out and called you, how did you feel? Were you, were you hesitant at first? Were you nervous or were you just excited that, uh, your brother's story was going to get this large platform? How did you feel when you first got that call from Mike? I was excited. My first choice for, uh, for someone to, uh, to tell a story on a national basis was Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> That obviously didn't happen. When, uh, when Mike called, I, I knew then that uh, as soon as I heard that uh, Gordon tragically hit were connected, I knew then it would go that far. Amazing. And so, you know, you and your sister have been able to travel uh, across Canada to share this story. You visited a lot uh, of school children in the process. What... Um, you know, what is something that has struck you? Or what is something you take away from meeting uh, youth and sharing uh, your brother's story? What is something that's really impacted you? I think I'll uh, first, uh, on Daisy Monroe, I'm the oldest of the girls, there were seven of us. Um, I don't live in, uh, in a book anymore. I, I work for Mishki Wagama and uh, just to let the parents know if they're watching on YouTube, uh, I managed to get some of my students in the audience because to me it's very important for them to know about the history behind residential schools because we have seven generations that have gone to residential schools from the community I work for. And I've been there since 1982 and uh, I think pretty soon they're going to have to move me out because I'm getting too <laughs> too attached to them. Um, anyway, uh, with this uh, residential school, it, it, we've been working on it. Uh, my sister and I sat on a working group with another eight others from different communities around um, James Bay and uh, Northern Ontario, and uh, we got it come out when the class action suit started and the payout started all that. But it's more than that to to us, like telling the story, uh, their stories is also important to me and uh, to hear their stories. And I know it's painful for a lot of uh, survivors and all that and grandparents, they're not grandparents and all that. And they try to tell their their children, their stories and all that, it always takes time and it's so painful. So it, it, it's good that, uh, that the Secret Tap is out there doing it across Canada and all that. And I'd like to thank all the schools that uh, called in to be a part of this book. And thank you, of course. Absolutely. Well, last October, we hosted 14 uh, Secret Path Week events. We had thousands of students uh, from across North America join in to meet uh, Indigenous leaders, scientists, uh, artists and explorers. So it was an absolutely amazing week. Uh, we really enjoyed speaking with Harriet Visitor uh, on uh, Monday of this week. And we have such an awesome group of classrooms who are joining us live today. Uh, I want to give a few shout outs uh, to the YouTube groups who have introduced themselves so far, just to give you an idea of some of the groups we have joining us. We've got uh, Baldenal Northeastern in British Columbia joining us. We've got Collingwood School in West Vancouver. Uh, group in Edmonton uh, is joining us as well. Peterborough, uh, grade fives in Peterborough, Ontario are joining us. Whitby, Ontario, we've got a grade six French immersion class there. Uh, Altona Forest in Pickering is hanging out with us. Highview Public School in Aurora, Ontario. Uh, another group in Pickering, let's see. Uh, Morrison Middle School in Toronto hanging out with us. We've got groups as far away as Alabama tuning in right now. 
uh, in the U.S., Hoover, Alabama. So shout out to Mr. Richardson's group. Uh, Mrs. Gill's joining us in Cambridge. Uh, so many classrooms. I'll try and do a few more shout outs as we get a little further in. There's too many classrooms to shout out to them all uh, right now, but I'll get some more of those in. But let's meet some of our camera classrooms uh, and let's get some of their questions for Pearl uh, and Daisy. So let's see, I'm gonna start off first. I'm gonna go to uh, Whitney, Ontario. We've got students from grade four to eight joining us uh, with Mrs. Poff. Let me get their microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, boys and girls? All right, nice and loud for us. How are we doing? Yeah. All right, who's got a question? If he didn't run away, if Chani didn't run away from the residential school, how long would of he had to stay there? <laughs> okay, so I can relay that question. They're wondering um, if your brother had had not run away from residential school, how long uh, do you think he would have had to stay at the residential school? From September, beginning of September to the end of June. Okay, so for, for the, the school year. And then I think they're curious to, um, you know, how long would that have gone on for his entire kind of school um, career each year having to go back to the residential school? Yes, till grade eight, I think. Um, yep. From grade one to uh, grade five was at the school. Then we got into integrating after that to five to six to eight. And then after that, you can still stay there if you're going on to grade nine to grade 12. Okay. All right, let's move to our next group joining us live. This time we're gonna go to Waterloo. We've got grade seven and eight students uh, with Mrs. Giannopoulos. Let me see if I can track down their microphone. There it is. How are you doing grade seven, eight? Hi. Hey, hey, hey. Um, we're Gregor and we're the change makers. Mustang Daisy makers. And we're fortunate have you here? Um, our first question is, what can we do to help further educate people on the Downey Wind Jack bus? Okay, so I'll pass that question on. I'll amplify that question a little louder. I love your flag in the background. Can you guys hold that flag up for us? Awesome. So their question is, they're wondering, uh, Pearl and uh, Daisy, what would you like to see students do to further the legacy, further share the story? What's the question? The, the students are wondering what you would like to see students doing in their classrooms to further share uh, your brother's story and the work of the Downey Wenjack Fund. The Secret Path book has, um, I think it's uh, loaded on the internet. There's a teaching um, uh, curriculum online. It's uh, from grades, uh, yeah. grade six, I believe. And uh, it's got everything there. And if you, if you want to carry on the story, you can follow that. Yeah. And have you, um, I know some classrooms have done things They've organized walks of their own uh, in their classrooms. They've done really incredible art projects uh, based on having read the poems uh, from Secret Path. So there's lots of ways that um, students can help uh, share the story and uh, make sure that others are hearing uh, the story as well. So I'm gonna duck back to YouTube because I know we've got some questions uh, coming uh, from YouTube. I'm gonna give a shout out to a few more classrooms uh, now that we're back here. So Mrs. Cheng's group in Pickering, Ontario, grade five sixes, Pickle Lake, Ontario uh, is joining us. Mrs. Bruce's grade eights at Algonquin Public School in Woodstock. Uh, shout out to Mr. Levine's group in Ottawa and then Petawawa, Ontario. We've got some grade six, seven, eights hanging out with uh, Mrs. Clark 
uh, as well. And so let's see, let's grab a question from online uh, this time. Um, okay, so um, when we talked to, to Herod early in the week, she mentioned that it was a while uh, before the family talked um, a lot about your brother's story, about Shawnee's story. Uh, so there's a classroom online. They're just wondering um, about, uh, you know, the family's reaction uh, when they heard that, that Shawnee had run away from residential school. Uh, they're wondering about your family's reaction uh, and how, um, how you dealt with, with, with it when you found out that happened. Um, like I said, I was home when this happened. We didn't know he had run away. There was no such thing as cell phones at that time. There was a there was a phone, but it was a one ring two kind of phone. And if you happened to be at that booth, you could pick up a phone. Uh, there also was no uh, any way to communicate to back home kind of thing. But the only way I found out about his death was CBC. CBC aired it from Winnipeg. And uh, when that happened, they just uh, started shipping us home. The way we found out was uh, the day that they brought up his coffin home. That was the time that we found out we had found out last one. Nothing was said before. No, that's 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 unbelievable, and to find out that way, um, it must have been really devastating, really hard for your family. And you know, like you said, it was it was a different time back then. There, we didn't have phones, we didn't have instant communication, and um, yeah, it's it's not uh, not a not a great way to find out that something like that did happen. So I can imagine what that did to you finding finding that out especially from from something like the media from a cbc story uh or you know from the arrival uh, of the coffin um so i can see why that's a, that's uh would have such a huge impact uh, on your lives and and why you you want to share that story so much to make sure things like this don't happen again uh in the future because even though it's a dark part of canada's history it's something that needs to be shared um so that we can make sure things like that don't uh, happen again. So we're going to jump to another uh, live classroom. We have Mrs. Mason's group joining us. Uh, they're a grade eight classroom. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing today, grade eights? All right. Who's got a question for us? Nice and loud. What would happen if you didn't go back after the summer? Okay. That's a great question. So, uh, Pearl and Daisy, they're wondering if you were attending a residential school, but you didn't go back after the summer, what would have happened? There was no residential school in the summer. That was the only time we got home. But they, oh. they had no choice. You had no choice whether you wanted to go to the school or not. Yeah, so, they're, so that's, that's what they're curious about is if, if you if you didn't go back at the end of the summer break, uh, I think they're wondering what would have happened. Would someone have come to collect you? What what would have happened? They collected you in the beginning. They made sure you went. Yeah. Most of those flying communities, uh, the plane was sent with a list of all the kids that had to go to school. And uh, if your name was on it, you had to get on a plane. All right, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's hard to think about, uh, you know, in the time that we're living in now, but um, I can only imagine what students, what, what kids were feeling, what, what you felt, uh, you know, when someone arrives and, and you have to get on that plane, you have to leave uh, your family. That would have been just incredibly difficult and just, uh, I don't know, it's hard to even find the right words to think about how uh, kids would have felt at that age. So we have Mrs. Burr's class. They are joining us in Brockville, Ontario. Grade six students hanging out with us. 
Uh, I'm going to turn their microphone on. How are we doing today, Brockville? All right, who's got a question for us? Sorry, but I heard the first, the end of that, the residential school. What was the first part? Like, what did you lose? Oh, what did you do? No, lose. Like, did you lose something, like clothes or something? Or oh, okay. So Mrs. Uh, Burr's class uh, in Brockville, they're wondering when, when, when you arrived at the residential school, what did, what did you lose? What did they take away from you? Did they take, you know, clothing from you? Did they take toys or other family objects? Did they take things away when you got to the residential school? The first thing that happened when we, when we went back to school year after year, the same thing, they, did, uh, they literally, DT, there's a DDT that they put on your hair for just in case you have lice all over your body. Uh, they cut your hair. Uh, so what length they want kind of thing, because we all had the same haircuts. <clears throat> and um, they also put on, um, well, the uniforms were only, Macintosh had uniforms, Pelican had uniforms, but the one we went to didn't have uniforms, but the, most of the clothing was almost the same. And they gave you a number. They didn't put your name on it. They gave you a number. Terrible treatment and, you know, almost, you know, inhuman treatment to give you a number, uh, cut your hair, um, and those kind of treatments. That's, uh, it's, it's hard to hear those stories, but, you know, it's, it's so important and so powerful that you are sharing uh, those stories with us, those stories from uh, our past. I want to say hi to Edmonton, Alberta. We have a classroom joining us there, grade sevens. Um, they're in the event, but we can't see them. So if you, uh, Mrs. Dodd's group, if you wanna send a question for Pearl uh, and Daisy via the chat sidebar, I will keep uh, an eye out for that. But while we wait for that question, we are going to visit our group at Dryden High School. So we have some high school sto students joining us in Dryden. Let me see if I can get their microphone turned on. Hello. All right. Hi, Dryden. How are you? Great. Thanks so much to Pearl and Daisy for uh, coming to speak to us today uh, via um, video screen. Um, so I have one question that was asked in my classroom yesterday, and I, with the permission of the student, I'm just going to forward that to you. So when we talked about residential schools, and they'd heard a little bit in previous years, and certainly in the fall when we were involved, um, a student asked if there were still residential schools, and students, are they still forced with the decision to have to leave their home communities, maybe after grade eight or uh, even younger? And uh, if so, what are some challenges or some positive changes that you have seen um, with students who are put into this position? Okay, so uh, they're wondering about today in residential schools, are there, there still residential schools uh in Canada or is that something we've left uh in the past I believe the last one was closed in 1997 but um as far as uh where the kids want to go now that's up to them and also up to the parents to where they send to send the children Okay, so last there, one. Uh, there is elementary on uh, on reserves now, K K four to grade eight, and uh, we also have the internet high schools that are nine to twelve, and lots of programs that are on reserve. So the kids do have uh, choices, wider choices. At least on our side, anyway, we have wider choices. Um, in Matawa, I don't know, I think it's a little different. Uh, like the, the students that are here in Thunder Bay are in the boarding home program, 
uh, some of the students here, their parents live in town, but they also have, uh, they're under a tuition agreement so they can attend uh, uh, a DFC high school. So they do have wide choices, but it's still a lot of parents do allow their children to leave the reserves to go out the high school to, uh, to come here and also to attend provincial high schools. All right. Um, yeah, 1997, that, that, I mean, that's not that long ago and that's still 30 years after, um, you know, your brother's, your brother's uh, passing away. So it's, it's, it went on for quite some time in Canada. Um, you know, 1997 is not that long ago. So uh, Harriet is tuning in online right now. Harriet just sent in a message. Uh, oops, it just went off my screen. There it is. So Harriet says, hi, mom. Hi, Aunt Pearl. I'm watching from my office in Sioux Lookout right now. So she's watching during her lunch, uh, tuning into today's event. So Harriet says, hi. Um, and then there's another question from Mrs. Mettler's group uh, online. And they're wondering, are you ever in touch with any uh, buddy who went to the same residential school uh, as as Chani? Are you are, have you been in touch with anybody who was at the school at the same time as him? Only by phone. There's very few uh, survivors, and um, his friends, I think, have all uh, the ones that he ran away with. I think. Uh, all of his friends have uh, gone to uh, the spirit world and uh, we, we had really wanted to uh, touch base with them before they leave this world but that was unfortunate that we couldn't yeah so our group in alberta in edmonton they sent me a question via the chat this is miss dodd's group and they're wondering how you feel about uh, non-Indigenous people telling or sharing uh, your story? Um, any hesitation or is it something that uh, it, it, you think is a really good thing and really helping uh, having non-Indigenous people tell the story? It doesn't really matter because uh, once they do that, they're stepping over the threshold of uh, getting along with the other colors of people. And uh, I cherish the thought that they, uh, that they are doing it, that uh, they're brave enough to do it, and that they're brave enough to do something, something um, to make uh, other people aware of it. Um, I'm glad that uh, there, there is a lot of people that are telling the story that are non-Indigenous and uh, I'm very glad that they are doing it. All right. I have another message to share from online. Um, Tara Charlie Monroe, so uh, Daisy's granddaughter and Trevor Monroe, Daisy's great grandchild uh, and her son are watching from Valhalla and the kids say love you grandma so that's a message that just came in uh, via YouTube so lots of family are tuning in right now uh, to listen to you speak to listen to you uh, share the story so that's so amazing uh, you've got to love the power of technology to be able to connect uh, so many people and so it's so great to have uh, so many members of the one jack family tuning in uh, to this event right now and there's a question from Mrs. Cameron's group and one of their students wants to know about um, if there was punishment at school, if you use your own language at the residential school, if you spoke uh, your, your native language at the residential schools. Did you ask if there was punishment for that? Yeah, if you used your, your, your native tongue, your, your native language. Yeah, I remember that uh, they, they would do it because they would uh, tell us that it was rude to speak uh, our tongue in front of um, the white folks. And um, sometimes the punishment was uh, the strap or uh, you didn't eat that evening or that you would pay uh, 10 cents every time that you use the language. 
I remember one year that I only paid 20 cents. <laughs> so a, a really common theme that's coming in from the class, uh, different classes watching online uh, is, you know, a lot of the students are between 10 to 13 years old who are watching right now. Uh, so kind of grades four to grade eight. Uh, and this question has come up a few times online and they're wondering about a message. If you, if you could say something uh, to students across Canada, uh, something you want them to take away or uh, something you want them to feel, what, what would you say to students across Canada? Uh, young students who are starting to find their voices uh, and look for ways to have an impact. What would you say to young students? I'd say for, uh, for the young students, um, listen to your parents. That's the number one thing. Don't matter what kind of parents you have, they still know what's good for you. The other thing is to continue your education. Be proud of who you are, whether you're black, yellow, white, red. Be proud of who you are. And also, Ward Downey always believed that um, everybody do something. Do something. Doesn't matter how old you are, you can do something that can make a difference for the rest of the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, speaking of Gord, uh, you know, earlier today I watched. Uh, some footage, some some backstage footage from uh, you and uh, and Daisy backstage. It looked like it was at um, uh, Canada Day uh, and and talking to Gord uh, and and sharing that story on stage. And something that that really struck me is Gord said he was nervous, and he asked you if you were nervous, and you're like, "Oh no, I'm not nervous at all." Um, and I, that really struck me. I think. You know, anytime that I, I've, I've heard the two of you speak, uh, you, do, you do so well, you do with such conviction, you share the story so well, um, and it really has an impact uh, every time uh, you share it. So thank you for opening up with us today, for sharing with the classrooms we had uh, across North America. It's so neat that so many of your family members were tuning in. It's great to have Sunset and William joining us. So thank you so much for supporting uh, your family in this way. Uh, and I think, you know, um, unless there's something that you want to say to the classrooms before we sign off, I'm going to turn on the microphones in just a moment. We'll give them a chance to say goodbye and thank you. Um, but uh, again, I just, it's, it's, it's really powerful to see uh, the way your family supports each other uh, and has worked so hard to share this story and how it, it, it's, it's just exploded into kind of our national awareness. So. Thank you for everything you do and thank you for sharing what is a really tough uh, story in the life of your family. I'd like to say my thank you. I'd like to encourage uh, the students that I work with from Rish. Uh, ask your parents uh, those questions. Find out where they went to school. Find out and you will find out because it's a part of our, uh, our history the residential school, it will always be a part of our history. It's also the language that we have to start learning and start respecting and start uh, using. And as for the other kids that are listening, uh, the different nationalities that are listening, yours is important to your language, your background, where your parents came from, where did they, were they born here, or where did your grandpa come from, grandma, um, those are here history, so uh, take time to find out those things. And I thank my family for coming out uh, and being here with me, being here with us and all that, and my grandchildren and the people from Pick Lake. I know the kids at the school. I uh, do work with the ones in the school in Pick Lake too. So if Rish is watching, uh, this is your children that I could drag out from to come and sit with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had, uh, yeah, we had classrooms from Pickle Lake, 
Saskatchewan, Edmonton, British Columbia, Ontario. So we had just an amazing group of classrooms joining us today. Lots of messages popping up that are saying, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your honesty. Lots of best wishes. Uh, and I think when I turn the microphones on, boys and girls, if you want to say thank you, Megwitch, if you want to uh, say thank you, those microphones are coming on right now. So a big thank you from our classrooms. Uh, right now, the microphones are on. Go ahead, boys and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, again, thank you so much uh, to the high school in Thunder Bay for providing a space uh, for you to come in and share the story with us today. Uh, thank you to your family and Pearl and Daisy. Again, thank you for what you're doing, for what you're going to continue doing, uh, and making sure that that this story is shared uh, and part of part of Canada's history. So. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hopefully a future event with classrooms again across Canada. Thank you. Thank you for having us. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, boys and girls. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weeks. Stand up so <laughs> wave to the camera. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we're going to take things off YouTube now. Good night. <laughs>